Okay. So we will go ahead and get started here. I think it's, we have 10 seconds left. Okay. So in 45 minutes, we are going to try to cover computer security. I call this presentation the fight for a secure Linux BIOS. Now what I probably should have called it was something like computer security or why we need a secure Linux BIOS, but they're actually, unfortunately, getting a secure Linux BIO is not all that easy. And so I'm gonna to try to explain a little bit about why we need it, what some of the problems are, and then this is the uh, website where you can go to read the 50-page article that this is going to be uh, trying to give a brief summary of. Now, about five and a half years ago, I wrote a book called Free Yourself from Microsoft and the NSA. Uh, that is available for free download at this website as a PDF. Um, I did that because I was concerned about the relationship between Microsoft and the NSA. I basically wrote the entire history of Microsoft and a little bit of the history of the NSA and how they kind of were, appeared to me to be working together. And I was going to publish that book in uh, June of 2013. Uh, anybody know what happened on June 6th of 2013? Literally days before I was going to publish that book. Um, it was Edward Snowden released all the NSA documents. I, I had to delay the publication of my book by three months to include a lot of the Snowden documents in it. More than 100,000 people have read this book. It's about a 400 page book. But what I'm doing today is kind of an update. What has happened, and I'll go back over a little bit of the history, uh, but then I'm gonna talk about what's happened between 2013 and today, literally last week, was the last set of attacks. So let's go on to the next one here. Um, this is what some people think is computer security, <laughs> okay? It's simply, you know, I'm gonna put a little band-aid over my webcam, I'm good to go, the NSA can't see me anymore. Unfortunately, things have gotten a lot more complex, and they get more complex all the time. So here's, it also used to be, in the old days, one of the things that I was, uh, I did when I, was, I realized that the Microsoft, the Windows operating system had some problems, is I switched over to Linux from Windows. Uh, but the problem is, what we've learned since, 2013 is that um, the NSA has actually created a lot more problems. So we have, this is a, a very brief view. This is all a simplified version. It's supposed to be an easy presentation, so I'm trying to make this easy. Um, you have applications, you have the operating system, and then you have the boot program. They have something called BIOS, uh, which is a basic input-output system. And then you have the hardware. And I realize that it's actually more complicated than this, but if you could just bear with me and consider this like five layer structure here, this is what we're gonna try to use. And so the, um, uh, basically what the BIOS was supposed to do in the old days, going back to 1975, was it was simply supposed to initialize the hardware components make sure all the voltage and everything was set to go, and then hand it over to the operating system. As a consequence, the BIOS was extremely small. And I'll get over a little bit of the history of the BIOS. And it used to be independent from the operating system, but in 27, 2007, a new type of BIOS called UIFI came out that was much more complex and 10 to 20 times larger than the previous BIOS that existed just a year or two earlier. So without any change at all in components, the size of the program increased by a factor of 10 to 20. So you have to ask yourself, what can cause an increase in file size of 10 to 20 times when there is no change in the components? Okay, so we're gonna do a pretest here. Uh, first, I just want a show of hands. I'm not taking names. This is, uh, and we're not gonna be scoring you here. I wanna know if anybody here thinks that the NSA has the capability of hacking the Windows operating system. Anybody here? Okay, anybody here not think? That, okay, so we're at least we're all on the same page here. We don't have to have a fight over this. How about, uh, does the NSA have the ability to hack applications like Microsoft Office? Show of hands for anybody who thinks, okay, so we're on the same page so far. How about, do you think that the NSA can hack the Intel processors 
uh, via the Intel management engine. Raise your hands if you think, okay. And how about if the NSA can place hidden partitions on your hard drive? Raise show of hands, anybody believe this? Okay, and how about, do you think that the NSA has placed call home functions on the UFE BIOS? Raise your hand if you think, okay, so a little bit less to think that we have problems there. <laughs> We're gonna go over this, let's go, let's talk about the next thing. So. What exactly is UIFI? It's something we know started in 2007. We know it's something that goes on before you start your operating system. For a lot of people, this is basically what they know about it. Other than that, they go, well, it's, it just happens to be there. What it is, it's a monopoly BIOS that Intel claims it's an Intel project that in fact, there's a substantial amount of evidence that the coding, most of the coding was done using Microsoft uh, languages. And so UIFI is a pretty much monopoly. It is found on all Windows computers since 2011, all Apple computers, and nearly all Linux computers. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's more of a monopoly than Windows. Okay, the only computers which do not use UIFI currently are Chromebooks and Purism Linux computers. Uh, these both use a, a free open source thing called Coreboot. Now there's another company called System76 and a couple of other Linux companies that have said within the next year they hope to also use Coreboot, but currently System76, I believe, is still using UIFI. UIFI has hundreds of modules and it's about 10 times larger than the previous BIOS and also 10 times larger than Coreboot, or actually even more than that. There's different versions of Coreboot, so it gets complicated. So I'm doing the simple version, remember? Okay, here we go. So let's talk about the next thing here, the BIOS. Where is this BIOS thing here anyway? Wrong. What, what's that? Wrong, right? It's in, well, but I know, but when you look at the computer, okay? So when you, here you pull off the back cover of the computer, where the heck is this thing? So this is like a spinning hard drive here. I know SSD's a little bit small, but this is the older picture. And so you have the BIOS on a little tiny chip that's kind of off to the side. How much damage can a little tiny chip do anyway, you know? So, but that's where it is. Uh, it's typically not on the hard drive. Okay, and uh, the total number of modules is over 500 modules on the UFE uh, uh, BIOS, and over 100 of these are connected to a very crucial thing called system management mode, also known as God mode. Anybody ever heard of system management mode? Raise your hand, so I, I don't want to be completely over your head here. But at any rate, uh, it can do remote updates and updates from the CPU and it can control the operating system. Basically, it is kind of like God mode. That's actually a fairly good way to describe it. Uh, and we know from the Snowden documents, and also uh, later on there was the release of the Vault 7 documents, and they also have a lot of information in them, that um, the NSA has several backdoors into the Windows operating system. We also know that the NSA has placed a backdoor in the Intel management engine since about 2007. And this we know, I want to, anybody here from PT Security, Positive Technologies, these people did a wonderful job, a service to humanity. I had suspected, and many people suspected there were problems with the management engine, but it wasn't until these guys actually were able to uh, basically <coughs> backport it, and they, t they found uh, something that we'll get into a little bit more, that indicates that it is kind of there's a special uh, NSA version, let's put it that way, of the management engine. And what we're going to look at is evidence that the NSA has also placed the back door in the UFE BIOS, and again, since 2007. We're going to explain in a little bit why the year 2007 was so crucial, okay? Now, so why is the secure BIOS important? Why do we even care? Well, one thing is a secure computer, if you want a secure computer, then what you need is a secure operating system. Windows is not a secure operating system. So this is one reason why I use Linux. You also need secure open source applications. Open source is a real critical component to security. If it's not open source, and I'm a little bit biased here, I don't think it's secure. I don't think the claim could be made. It's secure because nobody can independently verify it. Uh, you also need a secure hard drive. Be uh, and we'll get to this in just a couple minutes. You need a secure processor and you need a secure BIOS. You basically need everything to be secure. If anything isn't secure, then you've got problems. Now, the, uh, let's see, let's go to the next one here. 
All right, so they just arrested Julian Assange. Anybody heard of, know who Julian Assange is? Raise your hand. Okay, hopefully most of you know. Okay, the, um, without this guy, I wouldn't have any evidence. People would look at me and say, everything I'm telling you today is completely crazy. Don't believe a word this guy say. But because of Julian Assange, we have Edward Snowden, and we have all kinds of other stuff that I'm going to be doing in this thing. And so I hope at some point people will start supporting this guy instead of condemning him. A few other people that I kind of draw inspiration from, one is Gary Kildall, who was at the University of Washington. I don't know if I told you a little bit about, well, I'll tell you about myself in a little while, but basically I uh, have a bachelor's degree in science education from Washington State University and a master's degree from the University of Washington. So I'm kind of a local person. Um, and he invented BIOS. We'll get to this in a minute. We have Aaron Schwartz, who also advocated for things being in the public domain. Uh, so, and then we have Edward Snow, who basically is in Russia right now, but he released a lot of the documents we're going to be using here. Uh, I started with computers in 1962. I was 11 years old, and my parents took us to the Seattle World's Fair, me and my brother, and we saw computers, and my brother wanted to make a computer. And I helped him a little bit. He made a little computer from a kit, and that won first place in an Oregon uh, Science and Museum of Industries in Portland, a big award that he got there. And then he eventually went on to work for Intel. I learned a lot about Intel from him. And uh, he was involved in the start of the internet in the 1980s. And you can read the story about my brother on, my, uh, on one of my websites. OK, now, in 1985, I started a small outdoor store less than one mile from another small 1985 startup called Microsoft. Many of the people in my store, so I taught classes at Bellevue College for 20 years, and uh, I know more than 1,000 Microsoft employees. A lot of them are personal friends of mine, and I learned a tremendous amount about, about the inside history of the Windows operating system. I might talk a little bit about that, but a lot of that's in my book, if you want to read about that. In 1990, Tim Berners-Lee started the World Wide Web and a markup language called HTML, and then, um, which eventually added images. And in 1994, with the help from some of my friends at Microsoft, I started one of the world's first online stores a year before the start of Amazon. This is a picture of Jeff Bezos in his office here. The reason why I'm including this picture is because he's, got, he's kind of using a door for his desktop. It's a very cheap way to kind of make a desktop. And this is exactly what my office computer looked like back in when I started um, our uh, online retail store in 1993, 1994. Okay, here we go. Now, oh, then uh, over the next 25 years, in addition to teaching courses at Bellevue College, I also started to help more than 100 businesses start their own online stores. That is kind of one of the things that I did. And there's a real problem with online stores. It's just a massive problem. And it's a problem today. And, I'm, uh, and that is that hackers want to attack online stores, basically rob them of their money. And so these people that have online stores, they spend like several years building the website. And then the hacker comes in and wipes out several years worth of work. These people were depending upon the online store for their food, their income, their rent, everything else. And so I'm kind of really opposed to hacking. This is kind of where security, I think, comes from. And uh, so I spent 25 years studying this issue of computer security. So a couple of things about me. In 2011, I began to have a lot of problems with my Windows 7 computer and that the Windows updates failed to load. And oftentimes, they would not install. And I'm not an amateur here. I tried all the antivirus programs. I reinstalled the operating system. I reinstalled the hard drive. I did just about everything. And uh, I started doing some research. How? Here's the question everybody needs to think about. How in the world can any infection survive wiping and reinstalling? Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, go ahead. If we can turn off the, we'll just turn off all the lights. So we can do that. Okay, we got to mess up the TV though. Oh, no, it'll be fine. OK, now, so how? I was to asking myself. How can this be? When I put it on a different hard drive, I got a different op, I mean, it got the same operating system, but how can I continue to have, how can my computer continue to have these problems? And it's something that the NSA calls persistence. Remember the word persistence. It's critical. 
So I concluded that what was happening was there had to be something that was on there even after I replaced the hard drive in the operating system. And I learned that Microsoft had started, had added a new BIOS called UIFI without telling me, and that UIFI had kind of this call home function. And I began to suspect that this was a problem, okay? So I then started uh, using Linux and Core Boot, and after some real problems with Windows 8, I switched to Linux and Core Boot, and that's what this computer is that I'm using right now. So a couple more questions I have for you guys to see where you're at. Anyone here ever made their own BIOS? Raise your hand. I've actually made my own BIOS in the 1970s. See, I'm kind of dating myself a little bit here. Back in the 1970s, we would literally take the BIOS that Gary Kilgore made, and there were these little programs, and depending upon the hardware you used, that would help you configure your BIOS. So BIOS is not supposed to be some sort of complex program that nobody understands. Um, how about, has anybody here ever used use Core Boot BIOS? So we've got, good, we've got a couple people who use Core Boot, and it's a free Linux BIOS. It started about 20 years ago. Anybody reflash the Core Boot BIOS? There's a couple of free open source programs they're doing. It's, it's, it's not terribly hard. Uh, anyone here ever use UIFI BIOS? Raise your hand. Okay, there's a lot of you use UIFI. UIFI, okay, start in already. Anyone here ever use legacy BIOS? Yes. Kind of the old style thing. Okay, here we go. So, a couple more questions. How about anybody here have more than two terabytes of data on your hard drive? Raise your hand. If, Okay, so we got, I can't believe this. Well, anyway, I said, uh, my own view is that just put it on some separate drive here that we don't actually need, say, more than 100 gigabytes. I know I'm getting old fashioned here. And I even do video editing. I do a lot of videos. And I think you can get by maybe with 200 gigabytes, maybe one terabyte, which is 1,000 gigabytes. When you get to 2,000, now the key benefit of UIFI that they claim, oh, we have to go. To you with me, we can't use BIOS because BIOS won't work with more than like one or two terabytes of that. I'm going, uh, yeah, okay. That you know, I realize uh, that that's an issue, but most people don't need two terabytes of data. I'm a little biased here. Anybody read the 2,000 page Wi-Fi manual? Okay, I'm the only one that's actually downloaded and read the manual. I got it from uh, Julian Assange. See, thankfully, they don't actually release it to the public. That any of you here worked on coding UIFI? Do we have any UIFI programmers here? Uh, anybody worked for Microsoft, Intel, or the NSA? I used to work, I'm an escape metal patient from Intel Corporation. Okay, <laughs> good. My brother, literally, they drove my brother nuts. He literally went nuts at Intel. You can go nuts at either Microsoft or Intel. They work here like 24-7. I think you can probably go nuts at the NSA, too. But the, uh, let's see here. Use, how many people here use the Windows operating system? Raise your hand if you use yeah. Windows. Okay, I feel you. Yeah, I, I use it. Too. Did. A refugee. Okay, so <laughs> how about we have Windows 7 users here? Windows 8? Windows 9? I'm just checking. Windows 10? Okay, uh, have you ever been forced into a remote control of automatic update that you didn't want? Okay, this was driving me nuts. So Anywhere in here think there's a problem with having a UFE monopoly? Raise your hand if you think there's a problem with that. Okay, now let's move right along here. So I'm going to go back to 1970. This is what our computers used to look like back when I was starting. This was actually several years after I started. Uh, this is what we had at Clark College. We went to Clark College down back to. It was called the IBM 360. And we loaded things up in these little boxes here. And here's the key thing. It didn't even have a BIOS. That's how irrelevant a BIOS should be. And it worked fine. Now, then this guy came along. And the reason he, this name is Gary Kilgall. The reason he came up with the BIOS is because um, he had several different like operating systems, computers and stuff that he was working on in 75, and he didn't want to change the operating system around just because the hardware changed around. And he said, I know what I'll do. And there was actually another guy who suggested this idea to him, that what we'll do is we'll take the hardware stuff that goes on at the beginning, and we'll move it aside. And it'll just then go to this thing uh, here so that then they could just have the same operating system, which he also invented, and then, um, but you can have different BIOSes if they have different hardware. That was it. That was what BIOS really was, a very brilliant idea. And in 1981, IBM literally used a copy of his BIOS. And you can still download the 1981 BIOS and read it yourself. It's a very simple document. 
a very simple program that they used for the first IBM personal computer. All right, and they did it the same way I did it in 1979 and 1980. They used one of these little tiny programs to just simply say, well, this is what we need for our computer, and this is what the BIOS is going to do. And then other people copied this BIOS, and it's now called Legacy BIOS. But when they refer to Legacy BIOS, they're basically kind of talking about something they got copied over from Gary Kildall. All this went along fine until May of 2006. Okay, and then this guy came along. Now, and he announced in May at a meeting in 2006 a new kind of BIOS, and he called it UEFI, a term I hadn't heard before. And he says, we are finally moving away from the old BIOS to the unified extensible firmware interface that gives us new flexibility and capability, okay? Now, what we didn't know back then was the new flexibility and capability. By us, Bill was referring to PRISM partners at the NSA, and the new capability was the ability to hack into any computer in the world. You just have to kind of interpret. So here is a partial diagram of the structure of UFE. This is kind of what's so this is taken out of the UFE manual, and it really is just a broad overview. There's a heck of a lot more than this. Um, and in just two years, this is when the major change occurred, was in about 2006 to 2008. I'll show you a diagram of what it looked like, the change looked like to the public. Okay, here's what legacy bios looks like. Notice the date, 2010. Here, take a good look at this screen. If any of you, the whole reason, why do we wanna change the BIOS? Often the only thing people do in the BIOS is change the boot order so they can boot from a live stick or some uh, DVD or something like that. Now, look carefully at this screen. I'm about to show you the change in one year. Okay, here we have the new, oh my God, it looks just like the old BIOS. No. Well, it's very close. The only major difference is over here, this little, three, three little letters, IMPI, yeah. Extensible Firmware Interface. Now, this is part of a Microsoft strategy called Embrace, Extend, and Extinguish. Here's what it looks like more recently. All right, so now if you go into the BIOS, you will probably, today on your computer, you'll probably find something that looks like this. And there will be a button you can click for UIFI or for Legacy. And it looks a little different <coughs> on different types of computers, but somewhere along the line you do this. And in 2020, Intel is going to eliminate this option. This box will disappear in January of 2020. And then you're going to have to figure out if you don't want to use UIFI, if you want to use Legacy BIOS, you're going to have to figure something out. And we're going to talk about what to figure out here in just a couple of seconds. All right. So... There's another thing happening in January 2020, and that is uh, Microsoft is ending support for Windows 7. I know a lot of people are not very thrilled with Windows 10. Uh, the problem with Windows 10 is not only does it take up more room on your hard drive, but it takes up more RAM, and a lot of older computers simply don't have the RAM for uh, Windows 10, and so therefore they're gonna have to figure out something to do in January 2020 at the same time they're going to be transitioning, and this is mainly people with less expensive computers. I know all of you have computers with 8 to 16 gigabytes of RAM, but poor people can't afford all this extra stuff, and they buy the cheapest possible computer, which doesn't have very much RAM. And so it's really the poor people, the school students, the senior citizens, those are the ones who are going to hit, get hit most by this double whammy. Okay, and a lot of people say, well, Dave, you know, UFE is really not that bad. I mean, uh, uh, Ubuntu and Linux Mint and all the other distributions, they all support UFE. Why don't we just simply go ahead with UFE? And that's what we're going to talk about next, is what's the problem that we've got here. So this is one of the NSA documents here uh, that Edward Snow released. If you look at the dates about when all these people joined, I know you can't see it here, but this is the year 2007, a very crucial year, uh, because this was kind of around the beginning of the PRISM Partner program. Anybody heard of PRISM Partners and all that? So if you, this is probably the first slide that they released, but what the heck is a PRISM Partner? We never heard of this until 2013. Okay. Now, here's another slide here. This one was kind of released a little, uh, at, at a slightly different time. I believe that this was in September or something. Maybe, yeah, it's from a Spiegel article. 
And it was actually, the article was written by Jacob Applebaum, who's also from the University of Washington. And what it is, is it talks about the persistent division. The NSA has lots of divisions, but they have a division literally called, this is not my language, this is their language, the persistence division. This is why this word matters. And they had a job opening in 2006 for somebody to program and create a program for something they call berserker. I guess, you know, I can't say it real well. And it's to plant backdoors into the BIOS and run from SMM. And remember, earlier we talked about SMM. So this program, literally, they, were, they got the programmer in 2006, and this is what they did. And this is right from NSA documents. All right, so then we have, here's how the NSA is actually organized. This is an image from a slideshow that was released by um, Glenn Greenwald and in The Intercept in January 2019, but it's from an, a 2007 NSA slideshow, and it shows the various divisions, in case you want to know how the NSA is organized. One of the divisions is called POW, and then the subdivision is this group here, and then they have the persistence group here, and I'm going to show you what that's all about here. Here's the persistence division. It's slide number seven, and it talks about what they do and how they attack computers. It's actually pretty explanatory, and again, you can See this? I want to hopefully have some time for questions here, so I'm going to move through. And this is one of my favorite slides. This uh, is also a, from the slideshow in 2007. Actually, no, this is from the, the job application thing in 2007. And what they're talking about is something called Sierra Mist. We all really like the name Sierra. I actually named my daughter Sierra after Sierra Mist. No, I, actually, I, I didn't name her after that. But what it is... It's, a, it's an iffy module, and uh, it connects to SMM, and it has the ability to hide literally on a hidden space, I believe, on the hard drive. Okay. So now let's look at the differences between a virus and a rootkit. So we used to, in the old simple days, before our government decided to start spying on us, we had this situation where we would just get an antivirus program. And so if we think of this as a tree, the viruses are here at the top of the tree. They're the thing that you see and they're the thing that you use, these apples. And then the trunk of the tree, you might consider a root, the root of the operating system. But what we're talking about by advanced, remember the word persistent threat, they also call them APT, advanced persistent threat, rootkit, is malware hidden in the BIOS or the Intel Management Engine, they can survive cleaning, updating, or replacing the hard drive or the operating system. So the problem I was having in 2011 is exactly this problem. All right, so now let's talk about the war. All right, so the war started in 2007, and what this was about was the NSA wants, they didn't like Iran, okay? And so they, the cyber warfare is that this is the new type of war that's going on still today. It's not these guys with the big guns. The real warrior is this guy running the cybersecurity part and going, yo dude, back here. Okay, so this is where the real problems occur. We're gonna show you some of these problems in a minute. Uh, they called it Operation Olympic Games. There was an article written, a couple articles in the New York Times about this. A guy wrote a book about it. Uh, there was two versions. Uh, uh, Stutnitz was the first offensive cyber weapon in the world, and it was released in 2007 to try to destroy a lot of their nuclear stuff. And then they had a second version that was released a year later, or two years later. In January 2009, after Obama took office, apparently this is done by presidential executive order, that each president has to decide to do this. If the president, it's not something that Congress has authorized, this is something that the president does. And so when Bush went out, the program kind of went out with him, unless Obama said, yeah, let's go ahead and keep doing it. And when Obama went out, again, the program would have died unless the new President Trump says, yeah, let's just keep on doing it. Okay, so in 2009, uh, the, the earlier version could only be spread by USBs, but the later version had networks associated with it, which I think the, the earlier version wasn't actually UIFI based and the later version was. And in uh, July of 2009, oh, oh, and we know that it, it started going out in the wild. This is what <coughs> shocks you. 
that stack actually keeps a log of the of the computers and IPs that it hacks. <coughs> And so we, the log began in June 23rd of 2009 with Statnix 2. And then in uh, July of 2009 was when Microsoft released the Windows Server 2008 revision number two, which was the first com publicly purchasable computer with full support for UEFI. So this is kind of July of 2009 is when UEFI really got rolling. Okay. Then in January of 2010, we... Uh, we had a problem. And the problem was, and I don't know if the, there's debates about whether this was deliberate or on accident or whatever, but the problem was that UEFI was released out into the wild. And that caused havoc all around the world. Now, what it did, and there's lots of reports, I have links to all the reports about this, we can read about the Siemens TLC system, uh, and they were used in the nuclear power plants. But they, these Siemens PLC systems, which I believe they had the cooperation of Siemens on this, were then also used at oil rigs around the world. And these viruses, of which there are several, spread to the oil rigs around the world, including the Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf, uh, which began seeing drilling control problems and blue screen of death in January 2010. And I know where they were at because this is what happened to my computer in 2011. On April 20th, some combination of these things was partially responsible for a disaster that cost $100 billion and almost permanent damage to the Gulf. This information has never been released before, other than uh, what you're hearing today. At a hearing in July 23rd, 2010, their chief computer guy described what he called persistent computer problems. Here's what he said was going on with their computers for three to four months. Now, he said, this is three to four months before uh, the April problem. They had a problem, so beginning in January of 2010, the computers were locked up. They called it the blue screen of death. You would have no data. We replaced the operating system. We replaced <coughs> the hard drives. We got everything back and running, and the chair is the <coughs> computer controller would run for two or three days and then crash again. That's what you call persistence. All right, in 2011, there came up, uh, we discovered, actually it was in existence since 2007, but uh, people discovered it called Dooku. And what was interesting, like Stutnix, it was using digital certificates from Microsoft. But they weren't any old digital certificate because a normal Microsoft certificate lasts one to two years. These were certificates that extended out for six years. This is among the best evidence we have that Microsoft wasn't just a victim of the NSA, but was actually cooperating with the NSA in creating certificates that would be very durable certificates. Then in, 27, uh, in 2012, uh, we learned about the flame virus, also had been around for a while, and it was using Windows automatic updates to infect computers. Um, and then, uh, again, these were, certificates were valid for six years, and the flame was actually bigger than Stutnix and Dooku. It had over 20 mod modules, and instead of using just 10 command and control servers, it went up to about 80 command and control servers. So the NSA is getting bigger here over time. They're getting, like, more aggressive. And in 2012, uh, a group of independent researchers discovered that it was actually easier to hack into UIFI than it was to hack into the old BIOS. So the change was not about security. They, oh, well, we needed more security. No, you actually got less security by going to UEFI. Here's some examples. In 2014, a group of, another group of researchers found that SMM could be used as a backdoor to escalate the privileges, basically allowing a hacker to wind up controlling your computer. And then in 2015, uh, Kaspersky, this was, if there's one report you want to read, it's this 44-page report. That's why I've included the link here. Uh, but you can also go to my website, read the article, you click on the link. And um, what they call the equation group. Now, we all today know Kaspersky would never say NSA for anything. Because Kaspersky doesn't believe in attribution. And I understand there are problems with attribution. So they simply refer to this group of people, whoever they are, as a nation state. And this nation state had all these tools and was hacking everybody. Now, one thing you have to, uh, one, another SIM document found that the, um, 
amount of money put into these hacking tools amounted to about $50 billion a year. This was 20 to 100 times more than any other hacking nation in the world, including Russia, China, and the rest of the world put together. So for every one hacker in the rest of the world, there is 100 hackers at the NSA. Whenever you see any virus or any infection anywhere, the odds are 100 to 1. It was done by the NSA. The report described a, a tool called Grayfish, which placed a secret prediction on the hard drive where cyber weapons could be hidden from the victim, just like the job description in Sierra Mist back in 2006. Now, in 2015, you have another group of people called the Hacking Team that were using a UFE tool they called Galileo. This, uh, the Hacking Team is from Italy. They sold more than, uh, well, to about 30 dictators. They sold $40 million worth of these stuff to hostile dictators that were repressing people in countries all around the world. This is your tax dollars at work that a group that simply privatizes uh, what uh, the NSA had been doing. And in 2016, another root kit tool called ThinkPond was found inside of Lenovo and HP hard drives, again using SMM. This is apparently the most uh, popular way to hack into this stuff. <coughs> and then, um, so the next thing we found was in 2016, uh, a lot of people said, well, we'll just use keys and certificates and stuff and authorize things. The problem is the keys and certificates are not like the keys to your house. The keys to your house are controlled by you. Imagine if the keys to your house are controlled by somebody else and that you're not even allowed to have a copy of the key uh, and then, so Microsoft kind of does this, but then what they did, they didn't want to mess around with these keys. And so they created a way to bypass these keys. Uh, and thankfully, a group of kind of white hats found out, of, out about it, or the black hats found out about it. Uh, but nevertheless, keys are a real problem. And then in 2016, Shadow Brokers published a list of servers. They're now up over 300 of these servers that the NSA is using to hack computers around the world. That was in 2016. Okay, now in 2017, we have the Vault 7 documents that were published and they included a couple of so-called active UIFI projects that the NSA was involved in. And then in 2017, we have, uh, they published the Marble Framework showing that the NSA actually in search Russian fingerprints and Chinese fingerprints to fool people into thinking that we're being attacked by Russia, we're being attacked by China, when in fact we're being attacked by the NSA. And in 2017, uh, Kaspersky announced another hacking tool called NotPetya, and this hacking tool did more than 10 billion in damages. They claimed that this was the worst financial hacking attack of all time, and of course, hopefully you now know the Deepwater Horizon was 10 times Worse than that. And then in 2017, uh, PT Technology uh, reverse engineered the Intel Management Engine and discovered something called the High Assurance Platform Backdoor. Thankfully, they figured out a way to disable it. There's simply one little line that you kind of need to change here. And uh, that's what the NSA does. You just change one number, I think, from one to zero or zero to one. And then they have a tool called ME Cleaner that you can use if you want to try to get rid of this stuff on your own computer. And here we have a video in 2018, we're only a year to the present here, of a 20 year old hacker on YouTube explaining how to hack you iffy in a 13 minute video. This kid is only 20, this is embarrassing. And he said, I quote, you do not need to know much about UIFI because UIFI is badly written software. So when you get a 20 year old evaluating software, you've got a real problem. Oh, you know, he says SMM is controlling everything. So there he is, he told you everything you needed to know. And then here's the latest one. This was just about a month ago. Kaspersky announced the existence of a new UIFI hacking tool called Shadowhammer. Anybody read about Shadowhammer? It's a new thing out. What they did was use update, um, updates, UIFI updates, BIOS updates from ACES to install malware on more than a million computers. And this is an ongoing threat. And the reason why I haven't finished writing my article is because new stuff is coming out about this every day. Hopefully we'll have some better understanding here real soon. And here's the problem. You see, you got UIFI is basically controlling everything. You have all these computers 
but they're basically all controlled by UIV. Okay, and they're all doing this updated stuff. It's not just ACES. Okay, so here is a guy named Bruce Schneer, who said that the problem with, uh, for all of us is that certificates were hacked, allowing the bad guys to support certificates. When are we going to admit that the certificate system is broken? And this was another guy named Linus Torvalds. Anybody heard of Linus? Okay, the real problem is that clever hackers, or even not clever hackers, will bypass the whole UIFI key issue Rather than getting a key of their own, uh, or either get a key of their own or just simply going around the whole thing, and um, then they'll just kind of take advantage of it to bypass everything. All right, so here's a couple other guys. Uh, Corey Dockerell has been opposed to this stuff all along, and so he says, uh, anytime someone puts a lock on something you own against your wishes and doesn't give you the key, they're not doing it for your benefit. And just this morning, Cynthia McKinney weighed in with her own opinion. Cynthia McKinney was on a radio show this morning. My wife was cracking up over this one. She says, there is no such thing as national security when you can make a buck or two. That was <laughs> Cynthia's, well, we're trying. OK, and how can you tell the difference between computer security and slavery? Uh, well, we need transparency. Number one, if it's not open source, we've got issues. We need diversity, OK, as opposed to monopolies. We need to have the control come from the user, from the bottom up. You as a user should be able to change anything you want on your computer. I know I'm talking like Richard Stallman, but Richard Stallman is actually correct on a lot of these things that he talked about. And security requires that applications should not be able to call home without you knowing about it. And we need simplicity. We don't need a lot of complex code that we have no idea what. And so then there, here's something you can put in. Try this in the command line. Just open up your terminal and type in sudo app purge uifi smm intel and me. It actually doesn't work yet. But my hope is that someday that command will work. That's kind of my idea of a joke. Can you see the screen again? Uh, yeah, okay, yeah. I'll email it to you. Or you can see it online. OK, I've only got a few minutes here. OK, so. There's a new project called uh, Lennox Boot that's come out. Uh, it's being sponsored by a lot of major companies, and we have some hope for the future. It's not on very many computers. The second option you can do is what I did, which is buy a Chromebook and replace the Google version of Core Boot with a better version of Core Boot, and then put a real Linux thing on it. That's a pretty cheap thing you can do for a couple hundred dollars. The next thing is, oh, people say, well, what about, isn't Google part of the side network? The key thing is I not only replace, reflash the BIOS, reflash the operating system, I also replace the hard drive. I don't use hard drives made in the US. And you want to avoid any hard drives that are soldered to the machine. Then we have purism. I'm really thrilled with these guys. Anybody here with pur purism? Do we have a purism? Yay, purism, OK? These people are my heroes. They have actually. Uh, they disabled the Intel management engine. They use Core Boot. They're working on all this stuff. We, and System76 says they're going to catch up to, to Purism at some point. But thank you, Purism, for all the work you're doing. OK, what can we do? Well, what we need to do is get more involved. OK, this kind of is a political issue. That we've got to make computer security a political issue, that we need to have control over our own computers. OK? Now, so we have five problems here. If they hack the operating system, we put in a different one. If they hack the applications, we use open source applications. And to, we disable either the metal management engine or we use ARM computers. I know ARM has some problems, but there are a lot of companies working on improving ARM. And then we just don't use hard drives from the US. And we use Linux boot or core boot instead of UIFI. OK, and I hope that you'll share this presentation with other people. We have one or two minutes for questions, and I will stay around and talk to anybody for as long as you want. Go ahead. So, so where are you sourcing your, uh, your hard drives from then? Well, Japan, China, somewhere. You know, I know it's not the perfect solution, but I don't even host my websites in the United States because all the servers in the US are controlled by the NSA. So I have my servers up in Canada. Yeah. And then I have my own home servers. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just like a couple quick things. If you're using vanilla core boot, you know, you're still, you've still got a fair amount of proprietary blocks in there. So yes, you're free. absolutely correct. Now, <coughs> and what he's talking about is um, there are different types. There's Tiano. There's like little plugins that you can put into it. Some of them are proprietary. Some of them are less proprietary. So what I use is CBIOS instead of like Tiano Core. But you're right. This is a very complex topic, and I am simply touching 
the absolute service. But I, I so, want to stress that there's another flavor called Beaver Group, which has all the wild beers. There's a couple of small companies selling laptops, older laptops, of course, flash. And so, you know what? You send me an email with all that information. I will add it to my article. My email is somewhere around here. But it. okay, it's right there. The good. Okay. Now, any other questions or comments or observations? Yes, sir. Um, do, do the arm processor boards like the Raspberry Pi and stuff have the same BIOS problem? Okay, arm. Uh, first of all, Raspberry Pi is a type of arm. There's lots of arms, and the. Um, I've written several articles about Raspberry Pi and ARMs that you can probably find on the internet. Uh, but the real problem with Raspberry Pis is that they're using a version of Linux that's like four or five years old. And as any of you know, a five-year-old version of Linux is maybe just as bad as anything else. So um, a guy named Linus Torvalds is committed to helping Raspberry Pi kind of come into the current age, which would be this year. And they are working very hard on this. And maybe someday we'll be able to have security. But I'm not, I wouldn't go out on a limb and say that it's secure. There is another computer coming out in September uh, uh, from a company called Pinebook. Uh, they've had some old, I have one older Pinebook. But anyway, they have some newer Pinebooks coming out with four gigabytes of RAM that's going to be using ARM processors. My hope is Linus Torvalds has made a commitment to all of us. He's going to fix this problem by this summer, and I want Linus to start working a little bit harder and spend less time with his family. Okay, did you hear me? Okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> Linus, get to work. Okay, any other questions, comments, observations? Thank yes, sir. Okay, so um, I, I've uh, bumped into the Google folks quite a bit, and their security folks. Yeah. I know they go to quite some... Uh, some, a lot of measures to make sure that when they, the computers, <coughs> where, where the computers are manufactured for them and where they're actually deployed, they run all sorts of tests to make sure they have to be interfered with. Right. Now, they have their own system, and I'm glad you mentioned that. So a lot of companies are so concerned about security that they, they're actually, Google may be more aware of these problems than any of us in this room, okay? And they literally have their own operating systems and their own thing to kind of control things. They're kind of like the NSA. They also have kind of run their own little thing. And, um, but they have like a billion dollars or a trillion dollars or whatever. We have to find a way to have security even if we're not Google <coughs> and even if we're not the NSA. Okay, any other questions, comments? I want to thank you all for coming today. Great. Have a good time.